indeed. Let's talk about Brexit now, uh, as you know, a subject very close to my heart. Well, Keir Starmer seems to be very keen to get into bed with the European Union, as we saw. Uh, he met them all recently at the European Political Summit, and uh, he says we will not rejoin the single market or the customs union. However, uh, this is being reported in the Express. Sir so Keir Starmer may use access to UK waters in a trade-off with the EU. Yes, you heard that right. The European Union will demand access to Britain's fishing waters in return for Sir Keir Starmer's reset in EU-UK relations, according to reports. Now, the Prime Minister says he wants a better deal and spoke of resetting the UK's relationship, as I said at the EPC, the European Political Community Summit, which was held at Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire. Now, Brussels have prepared a list of what they're calling offensive interests, which I would agree with. They are offensive. Uh, they want to deploy these in the talks with London, and we believe, the UK government also believes, that access to UK fishing waters will be a key compromise in response to Sakir's wish for closer ties on trade, security, migration and foreign policy. This is all down to Emmanuel Macron, we believe, and he is very keen to do some kind of deal. I bet he is. Henry Bolton, former leader of UKIP, joins me now. Good morning, Henry. Morning, David. I don't think we talk enough about fishing. And certainly when I was campaigning, I think our fishermen and women in this country have had a pretty rough deal. They've had a rough deal right from the beginning, I think, David. First of all, um, during the referendum campaign, they, they were one of the topics that was front and centre, if you like, of, of the Leave campaign, and uh, which was, was led by Boris Johnson. And uh, the, they were promised the earth, really. The fishing, the fishing industry was on its knees, and they were, they were told that if you support Brexit, then you will get, we'll get our fishing waters back. Then we won the referendum, we left the European Union, and they got very little in return. What, what's happened... Uh, for people watching is that there's something that called the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and, and the EU which sort of settles the arrangements between us and um, because the French primarily but also the Belgian and the Spanish and so on fishermen were so they're, they're, a lot of them their livelihoods would have been absolutely destroyed if they no longer had access to, to British waters um, there was an agreement or part of the trade and cooperation agreement allowed a graduated return of British fishers, uh, fishing or fish, uh, fishing stocks to the UK. So not all at once, but graduated. So um, but that and that sort of went from just a, a few figures, 66,000 tons, uh, 66,000 tons reduction in 2021 to 110,000 tons reduction in 2025. So it's a big difference for, for the for the European fishermen. Now, the thing is that actually that was has not saved the British fishing fleet. And in addition, the last government introduced further regulations, imposed further regulations on licensing and so on, on the British uh, fishing fleet, which has, uh, has, has made them non-viable. So if indeed Labour goes down this route and gives the European Union fishing stocks, uh, in other words, they don't reduce... Uh, don't take back any more of our stocks than uh, as was planned, um, then the fishing fleet is going to die. Mm. It is absolutely going to, particularly the under 10 metre fleet. So uh, now why would Labour do this? Well, because financially, and um, the overall sort of figures of the economy, the, the British fishing fleet doesn't contribute that much. But if you drill down to it, the, the, economically, it, uh, it has been the mainstay of, of some coastal communities for centuries and largely still is. Mm. Poverty, and I, I live in Folkestone, it's got a fishing fleet. The fishermen there are, are putting all their boats on, up for sale because they cannot afford to fish because of the British regulation and the fishing stocks that are, that's available. So the Labour will destroy the coastal community fishing fleets. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. So it's also sort of symbolic. We are an island nation. We have survived on fishing for millennia. Mm. And it is, it is intrinsically a British thing, you know. Um, 
And, it, and so, it, it, in every way, well, so, so, so so I, if he goes down this I, I agree totally with you. I'm from East Anglia. We've got ports like mm. Great Yarmouth, Lowestoft, for yep. example. June Mummery, yeah, who, June Mummery, as you know, who was in the European uh, Parliament with mm -hmm. me, is absolutely incandescent. She runs a fish market. Yeah. Incandescent about the way we've been treated. Actually, I think the government, the former government, pulled the wool over the eyes of the British people. They said we would take back control of our money, laws and borders, and that included our fish as well. That yeah. is not true, as you rightly say. When you look at uh, whether we are catching more fish, so uh, basically we've got these new quotas for 100 fish and as you say, there was a negotiated settlement, so it drops down very, very gradually. So we basically got mm -hmm. 30 more, 30,000 more tonnes, as far as I can see. I then uh, spoke to some former MEPs yesterday and said, look, I'm not really entirely clear about whether EU vessels can uh, fish within the 12-mile radius of this country. And then I dug out the TCA itself, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement mm -hmm. that you talk about. Now, clauses 500 to 511 and Reservation 21 of the TCA essentially allows EU vessels to fish within the 12-mile nautical zone to 2026 and beyond. Also, it allows non-UK vessels, wait for this, to fly a UK flag, take UK quotas and land their catches in EU ports. Unacceptable. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know... A, a, a government that was putting the interests of the United Kingdom and the British people first would be would be saying no, this isn't good enough. What we would need to talk about is revoking that, not giving you more. I mean, it's it's nonsensical. But the thing here, David, is uh, in your introduction, and this is so we've got a major impact for the fishing fleet they have been absolutely sold a pup on this they have been misled they have been deceived um and they are still being deceived by the labor government but the, the, the an even more serious issue potentially is that the reason that the labor government would be considering this is to get an agreement on the eu in terms of foreign policy now um, as you as, as you implied in your in your introduction, now the I was chief planner for UK uh, for sorry EU common security and defence policy in Brussels for three years. So I can say with direct authority that you cannot separate when you're dealing with the European Union foreign policy from defence. So if we link our foreign policy to the European Union, we are absolutely linking, tying our defence policy, including procurement and so on, including deployments, including operations, including training standards, to those of the European Union. So, and we are, we are then, we, one of the things that Brexit did deliver was independence, if you like, in foreign policy matters. Now, we could discuss uh, for a long time the t uh, people say that we've sort of we were more powerful on the or more influential on the on the international stage in foreign policy terms when we were members of the European Union as as secretary uh, as senior advisor to the secretary general of the organization of security and cooperation in Europe I can tell you for a fact that's not the case we can discuss that mm. but the point now is that that that, that labor would be taking us back into being tied into coordinating our foreign policy with the 27 member states and our defence policy. Now, for me, that is a fundamental issue. If you don't have full control, autonomy, independence in terms of your foreign policy and your defence policy, you are not an independent nation. So, so, how, so, does, so, so how does Keir Starmer, if that is all true, how does Keir Starmer look directly in the eyes of those people who voted for Brexit, the 17.4 million people who voted for Brexit and say that actually what I am doing, I'm not taking you back under the auspices of the EU because you are? Hey, he's not. He's actually not saying that. He's saying we're not re-entering the customs union or the, or the single market. Indeed. Technically, he's right. But are we tying ourselves to EU policy making and some very significant areas? Yes. Now, why doesn't he say it? Because that's. It's because he's not prepared to look the British people in the eye and tell them. And what, and the other thing is, bear bear in mind that every single one at bar, well, all bar one of his cabinet were Remainers. They campaigned to stay in the European Union. His whole cabinet, mm. in effect, are pro-European and wish we'd never left. So whatever he says is just the, the window dressing because he knows that politically he would not have won the election and he knows that politically he would be, he would be facing overwhelming 
animosity from a, a, a huge proportion of the British people if he told them exactly what he's intending to do. Yeah. And the other thing, I mean, well, just very briefly, I'm still convinced that the Labour government, as part of all this, wants to have some, uh, wants to enter or be a part in some way of the EU's migration and asylum pact. And I think that's how they want to stop the boats. And, 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 they that, want to... and that, Henry, has been mooted in, in many papers. Sorry, I have to cut across Henry. you there. Henry Bolton, former leader of UKIP, thank you very much indeed for your time.